Chapter 8. The Battle of the Bands I knew the next step in becoming a successful drummer was to play with other musicians in real bands. As luck would have it, in March of 1988, my friend James Myers called me to tell me that his neighbor had a band and they were looking for a drummer. I was interested right away. I went immediately to talk with them about auditioning. I spoke to the guitar player, Ray Connolly, who told me that the name of the band was Menace and they had a show at a high school battle of the bands in a few months. He asked me to learn a few cover songs and come down to audition later that week. I was so excited to be talking to someone in a real band that wanted me to audition that I didn't even ask them what kind of music they played. Once he gave me the songs to learn, I quickly realized what kind of music they were into. They were two Metallica songs and an Anthrax song. I knew both bands because my brother was into them, but I personally wasn't a big fan. They were considered thrash metal, which was much heavier than I was used to. Ray asked me to learn Master of Puppets and For Whom the Bell Tolls by Metallica and Medusa by Anthrax. I wasn't really familiar with any of the songs, but I told Ray I'd absolutely be there to audition. Even though it wasn't my type of music, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to play with a real band. As soon as I hung up, I asked Dan if I could borrow his Metallica and Anthrax albums. Master of Puppets was the first one I listened to. The first thing I noticed was it was over eight minutes long. I also noticed some double bass beats and fills, things I hadn't really ventured into yet. I wasn't sure if I would be able to play the song without double bass. Of course, looking back, it would have been really easy to play the song without the small little double bass parts, but back then, I thought it would be impossible to pull off. Not only did it have double bass, but if this band was into this type of music, they would definitely expect me to play double bass in the future. What was I going to do? A few days wasn't enough time to learn double bass. Besides, my drum set had only one bass drum and I wasn't about to buy another one. Over the next few days, I learned the songs as best as I could, even though I really didn't like them. I came up with a plan to tell the band that I had injured my left foot so I wouldn't have to attempt any of the double bass stuff. I went to meet the guys in Menace at Sync the Pink Studios on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. I first met the guitarist, Ray. Since he was the person I'd been speaking to on the phone, I felt I knew him already. He seemed like a genuine guy. His brother Ken, the singer, came next. He was also nice, but definitely not what I was expecting in terms of what the singer of a band might look like. Even though my hair wasn't very long yet, I think I basically still looked the part of a rock and roll drummer. Ken, however, was a heavy-set guy with short hair and a very ordinary look. Come to think of it, Ray also seemed quite ordinary to me. At the time, when I imagined what a band would look like, it would look like a band. All my friends were jocks, and that's kind of how they looked. So here I was, excited to meet an actual band with the assumption that they would look and play rock and roll. I was a little disappointed. Next, I met the bass player and another guitar player. Both looked more like rock and rollers, but the kind that I didn't necessarily like. They had more of that dirty thrash metal look. I was definitely more of a hairband type guy. They were also much older than me, something I'd noticed as a trend throughout my years of playing. Almost everyone in every band I was ever in was older than me. The first thing I did was inform them that I had twisted my ankle the day before. But not to worry, it was just my left ankle, so I'd be fine to play. I just can't play any double bass tonight, I said. They said no problem. My plan worked like a charm. This was the first time I'd ever been in a real studio rehearsal room. It was very cool, complete with a full setup of gear for everyone. There was a wall of guitar and bass amps to choose from, and the drum set was a Pearl Export series. It was okay, but it was a little beat up. After about 20 minutes of setting up, Ray asked, what do you want to play first? I said, let's try For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was the one I disliked the least. He said, great, you count it off. That was it. The first time playing with other musicians in a real band. I was beyond excited. I wasn't exactly sure what he meant by count it off, but I'd listened to enough Kiss Alive to know that Peter Chris counts in Black Diamond. So I just went for it. I took my sticks and clicked them together four times and we were off. One, two, three, four. 
I didn't even realize at the time that the count was supposed to not only bring the band into the song, but it was also meant to set the tempo. I think I counted it at the same speed as Black Diamond. Luckily for me, it was close to the same tempo as For Whom the Bell Tolls. The first thing I noticed was that the guitars were really loud. I didn't mind it at all, and it actually felt good that I didn't have to play lightly to hear my music properly. I'd had that problem practicing in my room to my records all the time, having to play a little softer than I'd like to because I couldn't either hear the song or my bass drum would actually make the record skip. When Ken entered with the vocals, it left a lot to be desired, even for Metallica-style vocals. He wasn't a good singer at all. In fact, he was pretty awful. It didn't really matter too much to me. I was finally playing with a live band, and even in that moment, I knew that this was just a stepping stone to the next level. We played for about two hours, and they even showed me an original song they were doing. It was an instrumental called The Universe. It was pretty weird, but once again, I didn't care. This was the first original song I'd ever done. I was actually making up drum beats and parts for the first time. I loved every second of it. After rehearsal, we talked for a bit, but I still wasn't sure what they thought of me or if they liked my playing. I definitely thought I was good enough to be in the band, but I wasn't sure exactly what they were looking for. The next day, I got the call from Ray who said they wanted me to join. Even though I wasn't into the music they were playing, I still accepted immediately. I finally found other people who played real instruments and I wasn't about to turn them down. Menace was Ken Connolly on lead vocals, Ray Connolly on lead guitar. I don't really remember who the rhythm guitar player or the bass player were, and of course I was on drums. I was now officially a member of my first band. From that day in March of 1988, when I joined Menace, until this day that I sit here and read this book to you, there has never been a period of more than a few days where I haven't been in a band of some form. Crazy. After getting the good news, I knew I had to resolve the one problem that still loomed. I needed to learn to play double bass. I still couldn't afford a new bass drum, and there weren't any holidays coming up where I could ask for the drum as a present. Even if there were, I couldn't ask my mom for something else after she surprised me with my new drums on my birthday. Then it hit me. I ran to Madison Square Room, and in the corner sat my broken down old drum set that just happened to be the exact same color as my new Tama Swingstar set. I couldn't believe it. My problem was solved. I had my second bass drum all along, and I wouldn't even have to fix anything on the kit because I wasn't planning on mounting any toms to it at all. The only problem left was not having another pedal for the second bass drum, but I would worry about that later. I was way too anxious to dust it off and bring it up to my room to see how it looked. When I placed a bass drum next to the Tama drum, the colors looked identical. But alas, a new problem arose. When I went to place my rack tom into position, I realized there was now a gap between the 12-inch tom and the 13-inch tom. Since my 13 and 14-inch toms were mounted on my Tama bass drum and my 10 and 12-inchers had a separate stand, there was a gap. What was I going to do? With the newly added bass drum, they wouldn't reach far enough to meet with the mounted toms. Then came another revelation. I excitedly rushed down to Madison Square Room and grabbed one of my old toms and my old snare stand. Once back in my room, I mounted the tom on a snare stand and placed it in the gap between my other two toms. It worked perfectly. I now had what looked like Eric Carr's setup from the Animalize video. There were five rack toms, two bass drums, a floor tom, and a snare. I just needed to get another pedal, and soon came another brainstorm about how to deal with that. A few days later, Menace rehearsed again at Sync the Pink Studios. In the rehearsal room were tons of backup gear. So at the end of rehearsal, I put one of the older beat-up drum pedals in my bag and hoped no one would miss it. It was a dumb thing of me to do, but luckily no one noticed. It was probably a pedal no one even ever used, given the condition it was in. It was pretty beat up. With the new additions to my drum set and my new pedal for my left bass drum, I could begin learning double bass. The first thing I attempted was my favorite double bass fill, the opening of Kiss's Creatures of the Night. Surprisingly, after my first attempt, it sounded pretty decent. 
After about two hours of fooling around with double bass, I became pretty good at it, at least good enough to play what Menace needed from me. Menace would rehearse anywhere from two to three times a week, usually in Ray and Ken's basement. All the rehearsals were just to get ready for the Battle of the Bands they entered right before I joined. Unfortunately, over the next few months, the band really didn't sound any better, mostly because of Ken's vocals. I also started to notice little things in each member's playing that didn't sound right. I knew the songs pretty much inside and out at this point and could instantly hear when someone was off or out of tune, and both occurred quite often. Even with the band still sounding terrible, I was determined to stick it out. I looked at every rehearsal as another step toward reaching my dreams. I knew this was just a band for me to learn and how to play with other musicians. My first official gig at the Battle of the Bands would be on June 10th, 1988. This was the first of many times in my life where a gig would conflict with a family or personal event. In this case, it was my 8th grade graduation dance. While it doesn't sound like a big deal, this was one of the last times my friends and I would all be together. They meant the world to me, but I knew I had to play this show. I had to learn to sacrifice these kinds of social events if I was ever going to make it as a drummer. Over the next few months, while getting ready for the Battle of the Bands, my ongoing war with Sister Marie reached an all-time high. I was suspended five times during the eighth grade, and all because of my hair. It got to the point where I didn't even want to walk into school and pass her office because I knew I would get screamed at. She was really trying to pull some sort of weird power trip on me, but I wasn't budging. As long as I had my mom's support, there was no way I was giving in to this power-hungry piece of garbage. It may sound sacrilegious to call a nun a piece of garbage, but after all she had done to me, that's exactly what she was. She actually called a meeting with the other teachers to try to get me expelled from school one time. She called me a ringleader and claimed that all my friends, which she called the bad kids or the troublemakers, followed what I said. Getting rid of me would be for the good of the school. I knew this was her power trip again because I wouldn't obey her like everyone else did. She had repeatedly told me to cut my hair and I had repeatedly refused. This was her final attempt at dealing with me. My mom, along with all of my friends' moms, went up to school to fight for me and tell Sister Marie that I should not be expelled. Some of them even threatened to take their kids out of school if I was expelled. I think that was the ultimatum that saved me. As soon as it might hurt her and her school financially, she backed down and reluctantly let me stay. Of course, she knew that in a few months I'd be gone for good anyway. I had won this small battle, but the war was far from over. Still, more battles loomed ahead. Two weeks before our 8th grade final exams began, Sister Marie grabbed me offline and told me that if I didn't get a haircut, I would be taking all my final exams in her office. So of course, on the first day of final exams, I showed up with my hair the same way it had always been. Actually, through the school year, it was getting longer and longer. Sister Marie informed me that I was to report to her office every morning during finals. I proceeded to take my tests in her office every day. Luckily for me, earlier in that week, I found my old kiss book from when I went to see them at Madison Square Garden when I was five years old. I always finished my tests pretty quickly, and now I had something besides Sister Marie's ugly face to look at for the rest of the day. This infuriated her even more. One, because she saw that the tests were relatively easy for me, and two, because she saw me reading a KISS book after I was done. KISS represented everything I loved and everything we fought over. It was the perfect way to dig at her without having to say a word. Finally, the day of the Battle of the Bands had arrived. This would also be my first official live performance, since I didn't really count the talent show because it was lip sync. I was a little sad that I wouldn't be able to share one last party with my friends at the dance, but I was super excited to get my career as a rock drummer underway. I took extra care of transporting my drums this time, and I didn't let my brother touch them. I still didn't have cases, but I wrapped them in blankets and put them in Ray's parents' van. When we started to load into the school, there was another drummer warming up. 
He was the first live drummer that I'd seen besides myself, and he was very good. I was a little intimidated. Not so much about my own playing, but because I knew as a band we weren't very good. If this was the caliber of musicians in this battle of the bands, we were in big trouble. Years later, that same drummer asked me for lessons after seeing me perform at a club. My mom sat in the audience with one of her friends, excited to see her baby boy do what he loved to do. Menace was scheduled to go on third out of six bands. Once the second act was finished, we rushed our gear up to the stage, set up as fast as we could, and the guitarists and bassists tuned their instruments. Or so we thought. As soon as we hit the first note of the opening song, For Whom the Bell Tolls, I heard that they were completely out of tune. When Ken started to sing, he made it even worse. He was completely flat. I was far from perfect, but I thought I played pretty well, all things considered. By the time we entered our third song, I could clearly hear boo. Unfortunately for the crowd, the third song was our long original instrumental called The Universe. (laughs) I don't know what we were thinking. It was not a good idea to play a seven-minute original instrumental during a battle of the bands, especially when all of the instruments were out of tune. The boos got louder, and we decided to cut a song to end with Master of Puppets, another long song. Needless to say, the response wasn't positive. I knew we weren't good, but I didn't realize that we would sound even worse than when we rehearsed. I knew right away that this was my last show with Menace. A few months of playing in a band taught me a lot. I felt very comfortable playing with other musicians now, and I learned a lot about the dynamics of a band atmosphere. I also knew I didn't want to play any more cover songs. I knew to make it, I would have to be in a band with all original material. I saw my mom waiting outside and she looked so proud. She gave me a big hug and told me I was great. I said, Ma, I know we were terrible. She said, I said you were great, not the band. We both had a good laugh and went home. She was the greatest.